Everyone, if you're a guest or a visitor, we are truly grateful that you've chosen to worship with us this Lord's Day, and we want to welcome you to South Florida Avenue Church of Christ and also welcome you to winter in Florida. And I don't know who ordered this up, but here it is. So we are glad that you're here with us, and we hope that you find our worship service encouraging as we all seek to worship God in spirit and in truth. And if we do or say anything that you say, well, I've been to a lot of churches before. I've never seen anything done like that. Or why do you all practice that this way? We'll be glad to sit down and study with you or hopefully be able to discuss these things with you so that you can get a better grasp of who we are as we try to worship God according to the pattern that we find in the New Testament. In Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, Solomon says, there's a way that seems right to a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. There's a course of action that a man might take that seems prosperous, it seems successful, it seems like it'll ultimately end in victory, but the end of that way, Solomon says, it often leads to death. We're often faced with different choices in life, different circumstances when we can choose one way or choose another. And sometimes we choose one way that we may deem more favorable at the time, more advantageous to us, and we later find out that, you know what, I probably should have went the other way. Sometimes due to short-sightedness or just ignorance on our behalf as human beings, just frail weakness. We make the wrong decisions when we should choose something that's far better. In business, this happens a lot, too. And there have been some horrible business deals that have gone down throughout time. Think of some with me. In 1920, the Boston Red Sox had a player by the name of Babe Ruth. Does that ring a bell? And they figured they'd trade him to the rival New York Yankees, no big deal, just another, another baseball player. They would trade Babe Ruth to the New York Yankees, and he would go on to hit a whopping 714 home runs. And then the Yankees would go on to build a baseball dynasty and powerhouse. And I'm sure if the Red Sox could do it again, if they could rework things, if they could just have that deal back, they would change the way they did things. 1962, a group by the name of the Beatles. They went and auditioned or tried out for a record label by the name of Decca Records. And the A&R, the man that was in charge of talent for Decca, he said, well, guitar groups are on their way out. And I don't think that the Beatles have any hope or future in show business. The Beatles went on to sell 600 million records and to become the greatest selling band of all time. I, if you ask the A&R, you want to do that again, what about guitar groups again? He probably changed his mind and said, you know what, I made a bad decision. I made a horrible deal. He wanted to trade it out. Let's do one more. There was a company by the name of Kodak. In 1975, Kodak created or came out with the first digital camera. Great invention, great idea. But Kodak said, you know what, we don't think it's the right time right now for technology. Maybe we should wait a few years. And they watched the world explode into a technology frenzy. And well, Kodak would later file for bankruptcy. Bad deals, horrible decisions made, could have chose one course of action, but simply went in the opposite direction. And I'm saying that possibly, if you ask all three of those on the wrong side of these deals, what do they have in common? All of them would probably respond, well, it seemed like the right thing to do at the time. It seemed like a good idea at the time when we were faced with the choice. We didn't know how these things would turn out. There have been bad deals in the Bible, bad decisions made by individuals that you see in Scripture. In Genesis chapter 13, there's a man by the name of Abraham, and he has a nephew named Lot. And the Bible says that both of them had a large group of herdsmen and property, and their herdsmen get into a discussion or a difficulty one day, and Abraham comes to the younger Lot and he says, let there be no strife or difficulty or animosity between me and you and my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we be brethren. He says, this is what we'll do, Lot. You pick any part of the territory that you want, and I'll go the opposite way. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. Lot, the choice is yours. And Lot saw that the land of Sodom and Gomorrah was well watered and it was rich, and he chose Sodom and Gomorrah. Five chapters later, Lot and his family would be running for their very lives as Sodom dripped with wickedness and homosexuality. I think if Lot could do it again, Lot would choose the other part of the land. There's a man in your Bible by the name of Achan in Joshua chapter 7. We know about Joshua chapter 6, if we're familiar with the Bible, the walls of Jericho come down. 
They march around the city as God tells them on the seventh day. They blow the trumpets. The wall comes down. They go in and take the spoil of the city. But God told them before, when you go into the land, all of the spoils of this first city that you're going to capture, they belong to me. It, no man take any gold or silver or anything. It's mine. Well, Achan just saw this Babylonian garment, a little silver, a little gold, and he figured he'd take it and hide it. And as a result, Achan and his family were stoned to death and burned at the stake. Achan, he just needed a change of clothes. Or maybe you think about David. David becomes king. God exalts David from a shepherd boy to the king in the palace. And one night when David should be at war, he's walking on the balcony of the king's palace and he sees a woman by the name of Bathsheba. Bathsheba, Bathsheba there we go. We got it out. It's like a scratch CD. We got it out, though. But anyway, he sees her taking a bath and he looks on her. He calls for her. He lies with her and he commits the sin of adultery. His kingdom's never the same as a result of this. He would give the life of the baby that would be born to Bathsheba and the life of several other members of his family. God said, David, since you've done this, the sword is never going to depart from your house. David traded the peace of his kingdom for one night of pleasure. Horrible deal. And we'll look at one more. A man by the name of Judas. In Matthew 26 and verse 14, it says of Judas, he looked for an opportune time to betray Jesus. And he went to the leaders and the officials and he says, what will you give me for him? What do you want? And they agree with him for 30 pieces of silver. And he says, I'm going to lead you to him. And the one that I kiss, he's the one. Judas would later hang himself. He goes back, he tries to give back the silver, but they don't want it back. It's blood money to them now. Why didn't anybody tell Judas? Why didn't anybody tell Judas, you can't put God up for sale? You can't sell the Son of God. You can't give him away for a few pieces of silver. Judas made a horrible decision. In the business world, we see horrible decisions made. You turn to the pages of your Bible, you see the same thing. And all of these people have one thing in common, a short-sightedness. A need for instant gratification, a need to not think things through and make horrible decisions. Matthew chapter 16, the text was read into our hearing a moment ago. Jesus said to his disciples, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever will lose his life, or whoever will save his life, he'll lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake, he will find it. What does a man profit, it, Jesus says, if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his own soul? What are you willing to trade, Jesus says? What will a man give in swapping things out for his own soul? Let's study this morning on a few things that we do as Christians, as human beings, decisions that we can make that will be like the ones we've discussed previously, the worst deals we could ever make. What are some deals that we make that we don't even realize and we say, well, I trade this off, and as Jesus says, what is it to our profit? Number one, when we choose material things over spiritual things, we make one of the worst decisions we could ever make. Look at Matthew 16 again. In verse 26, Jesus says, what is a man profited if he gains the whole world, but he loses his own soul? Or what will you give in exchange for your soul? Jesus says, if you got the whole world and you just put one soul on the other side of the scale, it would tip the scale every time. Imagine if every car in the parking lot was suddenly yours. All the gold in the world was suddenly yours. All of the oil that men die for, all of the riches of the world. Jesus says, if you would give all of those things and in, in searching for things to please you, if you got everything you wanted and you exchanged your soul for it, Jesus says you'd be making the worst decision that you could ever make. But you know the devil's been getting souls much cheaper than that. I mean, people trade their souls and they don't even get the whole world. They get merely a fraction of what Jesus is discussing here. But Jesus says, if you got all of the toys, if you got all of the trinkets of this life, you still be making a horrible decision. Look at 1 John chapter 2. Turn with, turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. Look at verse 15. Look at what John says about our relationship to material things. And sometimes we trade material possessions and pleasures over the spiritual. And when we do, we make one of the worst decisions, worst deals we could ever make. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, John says, Love not the world, 
neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust thereof. But he that does the will of the Father abides forever. John says, first of all, we shouldn't love the world because we love God. And then he follows that up with saying, the world is very temporary. It's passing away. Everything that you can look at is evidence of the fact that it's temporary. Everything that you can put your eyeballs on and look at, that should let you know that it is not going to last. 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, Paul says this, we don't look on the things that are seen, but on things that are not seen. Things that are seen are temporary and things that are not seen are eternal. Are you emphasizing in your life right now things that are eternal or things that are merely temporary? The things in this life that are of material nature were never meant to satisfy us. That's not their intention. Those things only further ignite our appetite. They can't really satisfy. Think about this. Every November, we have a holiday known as Thanksgiving, right? And we eat and we get together as family and there is all of this food. And some people eat less throughout the week in anticipation of that day so that they could get more down, you know, and then Thursday comes and they eat. They eat their field. They can't even move to turn on the TV. They eat. But you know what happens? Some people the next day and then some even a few hours later, you know what happens? They're hungry again. I mean, they just ate all of this food, but it didn't satisfy. It only satisfied temporarily. Christmas comes around and Children make these lists, and mom, dad, if you get me this, I'll be the happiest. This is what I want. And you know what happens next December. They just need another list. Those things are only further ignited. Those things don't satisfy. We need to be careful about emphasizing material things over the spiritual because those things of this world, they don't last forever. They only last a short while. There's a rich man in the Bible in Luke 12. And Jesus tells the parable of this man. He says, what shall I do? How can I stow all of my goods that I have? I have all of these things. I don't even know what to do with them. And Jesus says that the man said, this is what I'm going to do. Tear down my barns and build greater. And then I'll say to my soul, soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, this fool, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. And then who's going to possess all of the things that you have laid up for yourself and Jesus says, this is what happens to individuals that are rich toward themselves and not toward God. Do you have the fear of missing out? Our society, our culture says, if it's new, you need it. You need to go out and get it. You don't want to miss out on anything new. You need everything that they offer. And sometimes we fall into the trap. We think we need every material thing. We need more, more, more. And Jesus is saying, wait a minute. Don't emphasize material possessions, material riches that will pass away when you can have spiritual riches. Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5. Solomon said this, Labor not to be rich. Cease from your own wisdom. He says, Will you set your eyes upon something that's not really there for riches? Make themselves wings and eventually fly like an eagle toward the heavens. What is he saying? Spiritual things are more important. Material things don't really last. And if you trade out the spiritual for the material, if your life is all about stuff, mess, and junk, and how much more of it you can stockpile, you're making the worst decision you could ever make. If you neglect your spiritual self for your physical, you're making a horrible decision. Jesus says, lay not up treasures for yourself on earth, where moth and rust corrupt, where thieves break through and steal, but lay up treasures in heaven. One day, a Texas preacher went out and he talked to a man who was a farmer, a wealthy individual, and he had dinner with the man. And afterward, they walked on this man's farm, and this man began to brag. He said, preacher, look to the east, and do you see all of that? I own everything in that direction. And then he turned toward the west and said the same thing. He turned to the south. He said, all of the oil rigs, everything that your eye can see in that direction, I own that too. And then the preacher pointed toward heaven and said, well, how much do you own in that direction? And that's what's most important. But Jesus says, if you gain the whole world and lose your soul, you make a horrible decision. It doesn't matter how loudly the world cries, get more things. Those things will make you happy. You'll always be empty inside. Augustine was right when he said, our souls can never truly rest until they rest in God. 
When we emphasize the material over the spiritual, we make one of the worst deals we could ever make. Number two, when we trade Bible ignorance for personal Bible study, we make one of the worst decisions or deals that we could ever make. When we say, you know what, I'd rather have secondhand knowledge and I'll let somebody else teach me and I don't have time to study this, I'm busy, we make one of the worst deals or decisions that we could ever make. Now, I know right now the two biggest schools for training preachers or the two largest seminaries in our world are Google University and YouTube, the school of YouTube. I know that that's where a lot of people get their information. But if you ever want to learn anything spiritually, you're going to have to learn it from here. Isaiah 34 and verse 16 says, seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. But how often am I too busy? I mean, Hiram, you don't understand. My schedule is packed. I have to get the kids, you know, I have work to do. I have to sleep and eat. And then there's my job and I'm just too busy to study the Bible. If I had more time, if I was a preacher like you, somebody says, if I had hours of the day just blocked out, I would definitely study the Bible. But right now I just can't afford to study the Bible. Nobody's too busy to go to the doctor when they're sick. Nobody's too busy to go to the store when they need food to eat. Nobody's too busy to go to the judgment when they die. You're not too busy to study the Bible. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. You think about exchanges that people make. Nobody here today and in, in the world is going to get to the judgment bar and say, you know what, I sure wish I studied the Bible a lot less. You know what, I sure wish I scrolled on Facebook a whole lot more than I did and spent a whole lot less time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I wish I would have did other things. You don't get to the judgment bar of God and say, you know what, I wish I forsook your word more. You say, I wish I would have made more time for these things. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, Paul tells young Timothy, study. Or your version may say, give every earnest effort to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Paul says, I want you to make every effort, study, be eager to show yourself approved unto God. You have to make this a priority, Paul is telling Timothy. You need to study. Am I trading off Bible knowledge and Bible study for Bible ignorance? I'm not a preacher. I don't need to know that stuff. I can't study that way. I've just never been studious. The Bible is a book that's designed in such a fashion. You may begin to study, and you may start out, and it may be tedious, it may be boring, it may be mundane, but the more you study, the more you set time aside to read, it grows like a flame in your heart, and it will bubble forth with excitement, and you will long for the next time when you decide to read. He says, study or give every diligent effort. That means I may have to get up an hour earlier. I may have to stay up an hour later. I may have to carry a Bible with me on lunch. Whatever you have to do, he says, if you want to be approved by God, you will do what is necessary to study. But how many times am I doing a bad deal? How many times am I exchanging? You know what? I know that this is going to be the criteria in judgment, but I would rather fail an open book test. I'm just not going to study. Jesus said, he that rejects me and receives not my words has one that judges him. The words that I've spoken. These are going to judge you in the last day. And he's given us the criteria. He says, you can have your own copy. We live in a time when there are more Bible studies, more helps, more translations, and simply less Bible students. And it's because we've made a deal with ourselves that says, I kind of like ignorance better. I just kind of like secondhand knowledge, not knowing better. I'd rather somebody tell me than find out for myself. The devil through the centuries has used many strategies with God's people. In the book of Acts, if you read through the book of Acts, this is what happens. There's persecution. He's pushing the church, killing Christians, and his mindset is simply, I hope they quit on Jesus. And then you move further through church history, and what happens is he tries to get the Bible out of people's hands. Well, just make it so that only the priest has the Bible, only the pope, and you have to work through him to get your faith. And throughout the centuries, the devil has used different strategies, but... With us, he's not using the strategy of getting the Bible out of people's hands. You can have the Bible all you want. The devil today is trying to simply keep it out of your heart. He doesn't care if you have one, if you carry it under your arm, if you have one on your nightstand, on your dashboard, so long as you don't crack it and ever get serious about studying. He's okay with that. Look at Psalm 119 and verse 9. The psalmist says, Where or how shall a young man cleanse his way? 
by taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart have I sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips have I declared all of the judgments of your mouth. I rejoiced in the way of your testimony as much as in all riches. And then he says, I will meditate upon your precepts, have respect unto your statutes. I will delight myself in your word. I won't forget your law. Have we forgotten God's law? One more thing about this Bible ignorance over Bible study. The Bible's a big book. It's 66 books really comprised in one. And sometimes somebody says, it's just difficult for me to understand. I want to hire him. I want to study the Bible more, but I can't, I can't grasp it. It just goes over my head. You know, I want to study the Bible more, but I start studying and I get lost. I don't know what's going on in this story. I want to make the right decision. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30 and look at what Moses says about the old law and what I believe is true about every passage in the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and look at what Moses says in verse 11. God has given the children of Israel a law and then he says something about his word that we really need to get hold of as we think about Bible ignorance over Bible study. He says, for this commandment which I command you this day, it's not hidden from you, neither is it far off. It's not in heaven that you should say, who should go up to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you can say, well, we need somebody to go over to sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. He says, but this word is very nigh unto you. It's very close. It's in your word and in your heart that you may do it. Moses says, the Bible, God's word, isn't so far off that you need to send somebody to retrieve it. It's not in heaven that you can't reach it. It's very accessible. It's understandable. He says it's simple, and you can grasp what it teaches. It may take some time. It may take some help. You may need to get a translation that you can read a little more easy, but nobody's going to get to the judgment bar of God and say, God, I just couldn't understand this. I, didn't, I couldn't read it. Moses says, yes, you can. God has made it in such a way that it's accessible, it's understandable, it's simple. And those things in the Bible which are much more confusing than others, those things that people have wrestled with are often those things that don't have really anything to do with our eternal salvation, but those things that men need to know in order to please God, in order to get to heaven. God has spelled those things out so clear that you need help to misunderstand it. The Bible isn't impossible to be understood, it's just often ignored. If I choose Bible ignorance over Bible study, I make a horrible decision. If I choose fear over faith, number three, I make one of the worst deals that can be made. I know when you watch the news and you read, on the, new, you read the newspaper, there, there seems like every week there's something new. Rick Scott comes out, there's a declaration, there's a Zika virus, is that right? That people are getting, don't go outside, there's politics, and then there's ISIS, and you just don't want to do anything, and the world is trying to encroach upon our faith and say, be afraid and be very afraid. If you trade faith for fear, if you allow yourselves to be overwhelmed, if we allow ourselves to be just overburdened with this idea of anxiety and fear, we rob ourselves of God's richest blessings and make one of the worst deals we can make. Look at Numbers 13 in the Old Testament. Numbers chapter 13, and we'll start in verse 27. When we do not trust in God with faith that we need to have, that's not to say we're not concerned, that's not to say that we're not knowledgeable, but when we allow fear to override our faith, we make a horrible decision. In Numbers chapter 13, God has told Israel, you go into the land of Canaan, I'm giving you the land. They say, well, we want to go and spy it out and see what's there. God says, well, that's fine. Moses selects 12 men, the leader of each tribe, and he says, you go to Canaan, spy out the land, and bring us back word so that we can know what we're getting into, and we're going to read the report that they give. Numbers 13, beginning with verse 27. And they told him, that's Moses, and said, we came to the land where you sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and Jebusites. And the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. 
And they brought up an evil report of the land which they searched out for the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we've gone to search it is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof and all the people that we saw in it. They're men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sights as grasshoppers. And so were we in their sight. Moses, you want us to go into the land? That's fine. We'll go. And they come back and they say, Moses, everything that you said about the land is true. It's a great land. It really does flow with milk and honey. But Moses, there's one problem. You didn't tell us about the giants in the land. You didn't tell us about the Jebusites and the Canaanites. You didn't tell us about all of those ites in the land. Moses, we can't go in there. And Caleb says, yes, we can. We can take the land. Be strong. Be of good courage. We're not going in that land. 603,550 Israelites die in the wilderness because they say, God, we can't do it. How many times, church, are we just like those Israelites? Now, God, I, you know about salvation and sin, the blood of, I'm good with that. But God, you don't understand. This is cancer. You don't, these ites are huge. I'm raising teenagers, God. These ites are so, they're so tall. We can't. My marriage problems, God, you can't help me with these things, my health, whatever it is. And we tell God about our ites, and God is saying, didn't you hear the part about this is the land that I'm giving you? God didn't say, I want you to go spy it out and come up with the military strategy. God had already promised to give them the land. But so many times we allow the ites and the giants that we make in our own mind. And the last verse says, we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so were we in their sight. Solomon said, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you think you can't, you probably can. If you think you won't, you probably won't. Paul says, God hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. What is there to fear as a Christian? When the creator of the world is in your corner, what in the world, what can stop you? Have we forgotten who's on our side? Have we forfeited? John says, this is a victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. There's a lot to make individuals fear, but the Christian, he has nothing to fear. There's nothing that's going to come up in your life this week, this day, this lifetime, that's going to catch the Almighty God by surprise. Nothing surprises him. If you choose fear over faith, you make a horrible decision. And then the last place, if we choose the authority of men and religion over the authority of Christ, we make a horrible decision. Authority has fallen on hard times in many areas today. Nobody respects authority anymore. You know about Boston and Ferguson police, we just, we don't care about that, right? No authority. School teachers, we don't care about authority. Parental authority, authority just seems to fall on hard times. If any man can go against authority, if there's anything there to buck against, most people say that's the route they want to take, anything to go against authority. And the same thing seems to be happening in religion. Man just builds a building, says, this is my church, this is how we're going to do things, and he never consults the authority. There are only two avenues in religion where men get authority. There are only two. You say there are all of these denominations, there are different ways, people worship differently, that's his interpretation, that's how she... There are only two avenues of authority in religion, and every individual that will ever approach God in religion operates under one of these two. Look at Matthew 21. Matthew 21, and look at verse 23. Jesus is approached by some individuals, and Jesus gives them the two avenues of authority that men have to approach him. When Jesus came into the temple as he was teaching, chief priests and elders of the people came to him, and they said, By what authority do you do these things, and who gave you this authority? And Jesus answered and said to them, I also ask you a question, which if you tell me, I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John where did it come from, from heaven or from men? And they reason with themselves, saying, well, if we say from heaven, he'll say to us, why didn't you believe him? And if we say from men, we fear the people, all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, we can't tell. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. When they ask Jesus by what authority you do these things, Jesus responds with a question. What about John? Where did he get his authority? Because me and John get our authority from the same place. It was either from heaven or it was from men. In religion, people get their authority either from heaven, from God, or self-created from men. If we come to Christianity and we choose the authority of men, well, I like this better. 
This will bring more people in. I think this would make worship more lively and fun. We make a horrible decision. Colossians chapter 3, and we'll, we'll close after this. Colossians chapter 3. Look at what Paul writes in verse 17. Paul says, and whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Hiram, that verse doesn't say anything about authority. Yes, it does. We understand this verse. If I knocked on your house door at 3 o'clock in the morning and said, I want you to open up, you would say, what are you doing here? And you better leave immediately, right? But if that same knock comes to your door and somebody says, you open it in the name of the law. Well, that's a whole nother matter. That's by the authority of Paul says in verse 17, whatever you do, that's everything. In word or in deed, that's everything again, do all. He says it three times, whatever you do, in word or in deed, and then he says, do all. You can't get around it. And Paul says, everything you do, you do it by the authority of Jesus. That is, as soon as you start to practice something religiously, Paul says, you better have divine permission, divine authority. Jesus has the ultimate authority. He has all of it. We have to do everything by his authority. And if we swap it out or choose to go another way, as it relates to our worship, our salvation, our organization, we make the worst deal we could ever make. What are you trading today? What kind of deals are you making? What kind of exchanges are you making that one day you'll get to eternity and cringe and say, God, I give a thousand lifetimes if you let me do it over. And he's going to say, you know, it's too late. You know, time has expired. The negotiation process has ceased. Are you a Christian today? The blood stands available for those that would respond, but will you reject that blood and then get to heaven and say, well, I chose temporary pleasure. I, to I chose to reject that blood. You can access it. You can turn from sin and repent, and you can say, I, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, and be baptized the way that he says and for the reason that he says. That's submitting to his authority. He's the only one that can save you. I don't do it. The church doesn't do it. Jesus will save you, and then he'll add you to his church. You're a Christian and you say, I'm examining my life and I'm making some small compromises. They don't seem like a big deal, but I'm, I'm starting to see that they are. I've been too busy to study the Bible, emphasizing material things over spiritual. I really need to dig down deep and I need to turn over a new leaf. The negotiation process for your very soul is taking place right now. And one day the time will expire and we'll give a thousand words like this one to just have another chance at it. But God is saying, today you can choose to do the right thing. If you stand subject to the invitation, you need to be restored. You need to respond in faith to Jesus for the first time. Why don't you choose the right thing? And do it now as together we stand and sing. So oh.